Hello, the internet. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Lost in Criterion, the show where Pat Dorgan... Hello. Say hi, Pat. I'm Pat Dorgan. And I... Oh, I've talked over you. And I, the Adam Glass, will slowly work our th- way through every single film ever released by the Criterion Collection. Tell you folks what we think. That is... 600. There's uh, 69 films right now. Pat, are you ready for that commitment? Uh, um, no. 690. Did you say 69 That's films? That's like 12 years. I did say 69. That's because I'm totally ready for 69 films. That's <laughs> that's not going to be hard at all. And that sounds like a dirty joke. Ah, too. I'll learn to talk on it. Just a little housekeeping note. Pat is in Japan, and I am in Ohio, so we're on a 13-hour difference. He's about to go to bed, and I woke up early on a Saturday to do this. So, be- if we're tired and rambling, yeah. you'll know why. If we fall asleep, I am a sorry. Yeah, so just appreciate what we're doing for you. So we're watching all of the movies in order. Uh, our first film then, Spy Number 1 in the Criterion Collection, their first release is The Grand Illusion by Jean Renoir, 1937 war film, anti-war film, really. Um, Renoir is the son of the French Impressionist painter, uh, which is interesting. You don't really... You get the genius, I think, from that, because Renoir is <laughs> a great painter as well, his father. But, uh, but it's certainly not very Impressionistic in this no, film. No, no, there's not really um, that element. <laughs> you don't, don't get yeah. into that. Um, uh, the movie is routinely listed on greatest movies ever made lists. Uh, certainly considered one of the greatest war movies. So, uh, well, greatest movies about war, I guess. Not necessarily greatest war movie, because it's not really a war movie. No, there's no war in uh, this movie. Yeah. Um, the war is kind of a, a background to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the story of some... French officers who get captured uh, and sent to a POW camp that's supposedly inescapable. Was the first one supposedly um, inescapable, or is it just the last one? Well, I don't... The last one is yeah. inescapable. And there's actually... There's a there's a little time jump in there, um, because it seems like they they go straight from the first one to the well, second one. Well, yeah, yeah. One, there's like... They, it's, it. they talk about, like, five other ones that they... Yeah. Like, they hiding out a laundry they, basket. They try to escape and, from other places. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that Rosenthal, one of our one of our characters, is reintroduced to them at the second camp as if they haven't seen him for a while, yeah. uh, certainly certainly suggests that's not entirely clear on one watching. Yeah, um, but yeah. Um, so our, our main characters then, they're Rosenthal. Um, he's uh, the son of some Jewish bankers, a uh, French airman uh, captured. Uh, we've got Marichal, the middle class mechanic uh, who became a pilot. Um, He's from Paris, and we've got the aristocrat on the French side, uh, Captain de Bourdieu. I, I, I can't speak either. French, so hopefully I'm pronouncing these things relatively correctly. Baldui is um, how I pronounce it. Baldui? <laughs> no, you don't do the dewey. Well. Not, in, not in French. I know that much, maybe. <laughs> um, and and to get us into the plot of the movie, one of one of de Bourdieu's, uh, de Bourdieu, now I'm going to it's, say it all it's going to be a really big problem. Um, uh, one of the things he he says that that gets us into the bulk of the film: uh, tennis court is for playing tennis, a uh, prison camp is for escaping. Uh, it's his duty to get out. Right. Um, in that regard, while there's no real bad guy in this movie, which is very interesting and something I'm sure we'll get into later. Um, the German pilot who shot down de Baudier and Marichal at the beginning ends up as the commandant of that second prison camp, the impenetrable, inescapable fortress. Um, and he is also a German aristocrat himself and pilot and a uh, very interesting fellow yeah. in that he's he's incredibly cordial. Yeah, as well. Yes, and uh, well, we didn't um, say his name, so it's von Raufenstein. Is his name. Yes, von Raufenstein. And he... Um, is also by the se- by the second half of the film, basically Doctor Doom. Yes, <laughs> made, yes, he's fifty percent metal at least. He is fifty percent metal. He looks he looks like Anakin Skywalker. Yes, after the and before they put on the mask. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, I'm sorry to reference in a a a early episode. No, right to, to even bring up the the first three to even movies. Bring yeah. up the prequels, yeah. but. <laughs> But uh, we'll get into that. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get into things. Uh, we're really just here to talk about it, not necessarily review, just what we think. And uh, 
So we'll uh, <laughs> we'll see how this yeah, goes. You know what I was thinking, fun, though, is hopefully. right about now is when we should totally have a little bit of theme music after the introduction. So where do we start? Well, um, I'd like to... I think I think it being a very weird anti-war film, most of what we're going to talk about is, is the theme of that. So <laughs> okay. let's put that off to okay. the end. <laughs> save the best for last. And uh, we'll, we'll save the bulk. You know, we build up the, the pyramid shape of our essay. I sort suppose. of a reverse pyramid? Uh, well, um... Assuming we're building from the... Talking I'm confused. Writing. <laughs> anyway, we'll get we'll get to the we'll get to the bulky stuff. Yes, a reverse pyramid, I guess. Yeah, at the end. Anyway, um, so so first thing I'd like to like to talk about the the sound and the cinematography okay. of this movie. Um, great stuff. Um, the sound the sound less so. I wasn't really conscious of this until one of the last scenes in the last twenty minutes when they when Marshall and. Uh, Rosenthal, or have escaped. Um, I read uh, that uh, Jean Renoir didn't like post-production sound. He didn't like dubbing at okay. all. Um, so he really wanted everything to be natural and everything to be recorded as the film was being recorded. Um, so there's a lot. You see it a little bit um, both in the escape sequence um, with the with the flutes. Mm-hmm. And after they've escaped, there's a scene where they're having an argument on top of a on top of a ridge, and you can. I was really conscious of it at that point. The wind in the background. Oh yeah, I didn't even notice it. Doesn't seem to. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be added in. It just seems to be there. But it's so. It's still subdued. It's yeah. not like. It's not like if I was recording the movie with my phone. Right, right. And the wind was howling over the microphone so that we couldn't hear anything, um, which I've done, and that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> that's why you need boom mics. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's, it's really, it's an interesting way to do sound, I think. And certainly even more interesting for the time period, because you don't necessarily think about microphones being good enough to right. do that in 1937. Well, and something I, it was weird that you bring that up because there were a couple of times where the sound was really suddenly unnatural to me. Like, it had a very almost slapstick quality at a couple times, where, like, there was a really weird, like, boing noise or something like that. And it's yeah, really yeah, weird for they... me to imagine that they didn't dub that over, but maybe there was a dude on set making well, boing maybe, noises. Maybe, maybe there was, or maybe the reason it seems so unnatural it's because everything is because else is natural. suddenly we have, a, we have a very unnatural sound effect yeah. coming in. And I didn't, I mean, I don't... So I'm not I'm not there, so I don't know right. what was naturally recorded and what <laughs> wasn't. Um, yeah, but uh, but I did I did I did see that Renoir didn't like that dub sound. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely in the conversations De Boulier has while he's escaping, you've got that sort of distance yelling yeah. too. That really it establishes distance just in the sound, and that's. It's not necessarily something movies go for anymore. Well, yeah. And yeah. he... Yeah, I mean, those... That element is... It's kind of nice. And, like, you also, like, with, like, the flute playing... When he's playing the flute on the roof... Like, while they're having the meeting... Like, you really get a feeling like, wow, he's... Really far away. Somewhere yeah. totally different part of the castle. Yeah, he's... Yeah. He's, like, on the top of the castle yelling down at yeah. the courtyard. It's... <laughs> yeah. Um... So yeah, that that does a lot, and I think, kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, the cinematography, while while the sound can establish that distance, um, the cinematography exp- gets this real closeness to things too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's one there's one early scene where they first meet Rosenthal, and he's sharing his care package from his from his rich banker parents. Um, with them when they first get to the first camp, and it's it's 
it's a style repeated throughout. It's clearly something Renoir likes, but he does a tracking shot instead of jumping around, right. and he just kind of constantly circles the table mm-hmm. for the entirety of that scene, the entire conversation, um, five minutes or so. <laughs> And we never cut, and it really makes you feel like you're part of the conversation. Yeah, and it actually not just I, I really preferred it to kind of the more kind of cut up dialogue because you really kind of it felt more natural. I would say like I didn't I didn't yeah. notice the editing, which made it feel very comfortable. Yeah. Whereas you know every time like it, you know you watch modern TV or modern movies, a lot of times you get that every time there's a break to go to somebody else's. Like close up, it's like oh, you can kind of feel it. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. So this it really it really helps the natural flow of things. Uh, there's another scene where he uses that um, to a much more poignancy. Uh, just they they put on the show at the first right. camp, and when they get the costumes, that one guy we never even meet him, but he's he's the one who gets to try yeah, on the, the dress. dresses that they brought in first. And he walks in, and it's like, oh, it's funny how how cute I look, right? Right, <laughs> yeah, guys? Yeah. And everybody's just dumbfounded and staring jaws again. Yeah, everything just stops. <laughs> because they haven't seen a woman in so yeah. long. Everything just stops. Well, and I really hit and that. we get 30 seconds of panning across And that, that his editing on that actually increases the awkwardness of the moment, too. Like, it really works out really yes, well. You're like, yes, exactly. Because there's no, there's no because cut. It's just like 30 seconds of everybody yeah. just being totally aware yeah Lusting like there's like this, this dude who vaguely looks like a woman yeah and and you know there's no there's no background yeah. sound there's no background dead, dead music still, at that point yeah. it's just dead. just silent staring and it really yeah there's it's really yeah it's a, a lot of awkwardness in that moment <laughs> that's certainly yeah. true well and then like that, that um, actually brings up like I, I i pointed this out before we started the podcast the uh there's a scene where the camera travels, if my memory serves, I think I remember this correctly, travels through the window <laughs> and passes through an initial conversation between two characters about, I think, about their escape plan. And then goes through their conversation after they finish and then continues down a table to the work that another guy is doing at the table for the escape mm-hmm. plan, like putting whatever they were talking about into yeah. action. And it never breaks for the entire time. There's no cut. It just yeah. keeps going. And it's a really fancy shot yeah uh, it's fancy it's it's beautiful yeah. shots and there's well and considering the time something period. something that happens something that happens a lot in the movie is this sort of sense of action in the background yeah. and and in that scene in particular he jumps to that action without jumping yeah. i mean he slides to that action but there's scenes um there's a really great scene at the first camp when everybody's in the uh, in the room practicing their lines, um, and in the background through the window we see the young German yeah. soldiers training training for battle, and uh, De Boulier says something like, uh, "He says, oh, it's you know, boys, children acting like soldiers as soldiers act like yeah. children because they're doing their play." And he's he's kind of steadfast against it because he considers it below him. He still supports them, but he doesn't want to be a part of it. Um, <coughs> which is really interesting. It's this her aristocracy thing, which he he kind of overcomes. Yeah, later. it's a really um, weird transformation. Sure we'll I guess we're not ready yeah. to move on to he's, that, but yeah, his transformation <laughs> is really kind of funny. Really, yeah, we'll get we'll get into that later. I'm sure because certainly one of the major themes of this is. Um, the whole class system hmm. uh, that World War One kind of destroyed. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but one more note. One more note on the cinematography, and and we'll we'll slide into the rest of this. Um, another another thing. You know the whole soldier thing kind of established the use of background for action, but there's also this background. Um, just for emotional effect uh, at the second camp, especially. <clears throat> whenever two characters are having a conversation in front of a wall, after that conversation ends, the camera will linger and focus over the wall at the countryside in the background. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's just this this thing they can't get to. And they do that, he does that again when Rosenthal and Marischal have that fight while they're escaping, and Marischal storms off. 
um, yeah, it kind of starts to focus on the hills in the background, which very well might be trying to imply that that's Switzerland just a little right. bit further away, or even so, they need to that's escape further right. away while they're having this fight that's jeopardizing them yeah, getting yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah, you, uh, yeah, you um, kind of. He really does a good job of like emphasizing that, like how close they are to being free, even when they're in the camp. There's only like a chain link fa- fence yeah. between them and freedom, but that chain link yeah. fence might as well be like, you know, a hundred feet wide. So, exactly, exactly. It's really the camera is used very well to help tell the yeah. story, and that's. That's something that doesn't doesn't happen enough. It's something that happens really well. Actually, I just had this conversation a few days ago. Um, John Carpenter's The Thing. You know, I've never seen John Carpenter's uh, The Cinema. It's a great, one of the best horror movies I've ever seen. It's more a terror yeah. movie than anything. And, and it's a terror movie in part because of the cinematography. There's a lot of long tracking shots that uh, just really establish claustrophobia and paranoia. Just the way it's shot. Um, and I think using using the camera work to tell the story like that is really uh, really special. Yeah. I think it doesn't happen enough. <laughs> I mean, and that's obviously that's what good cinematography is. Right. But at the same time, at the same time, there's a lot of bad cinematography. Well, yeah, and you can definitely tell that. Like, um, I wonder honestly, in some way, like when the the Rim, I guess Renoir Jr. basically is making this film <laughs> if sort of the aesthetic aspects of his father kind of play into like the things he does like he feels like the oh, cinema I, I just wonder because like you a lot of directors you don't get a real feel that they understand the aesthetics of what they're doing yeah they're no, more I think con- concerned with the story than they are with the aesthetics of it so. Yeah, I think that's something that definitely played into it. I mean, because his being the son of an impressionist painter, obviously he's been around a lot yeah. of artists all his life. I mean, Renoir wasn't one of those... He, he wasn't like a struggling artist yeah. alone and unrecognized in his day. He was he was definitely definitely popular while he was alive. Maybe I'm making that up. But we might be, but you know, who's going to fact us? Sure. Yeah. We yeah, don't no even have a phone address. number or an email address that people can contact us. Even if they disagree, you know, <laughs> keep it to themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I guess that kind of gets us through some yeah. technical aspects. I'd really like to talk about the themes of the movie and get get into this a little more. Um, one one thing before we start, I said I said this was an anti-war film earlier, but it's kind of it's a weird anti-war yeah. film because there's no real bad guys. There's no bad guys, but and it's there's still no war. it's still anti-war, and there's no it's... war. I mean, the the war is a backdrop, um, but it's still it's subtle in that, but it's still strong enough that this movie was actually banned in Germany. It was made in 1937, just on the brink of World War II. Um, it was banned in Germany. Uh, um, and uh, Goebbels, I couldn't remember his name for a second. Goebbels actually declared it public enemy, cinematic public enemy number one. Yeah, I can see that, especially um, if you don't have like some of the more recent uh, anti-war films that have happened since then. This would be a very yeah nasty. There's, bit. there's a lot of less, a lot less subtlety yeah. in, in war. I think I think it's interesting though that at the same time after the New York premiere, uh, FDR. Uh, declared that anyone who loves democracy needs to see this. <laughs> yeah, film. It, you know, but it makes. Um, I, I, I do understand the idea. Like, I mean, because this film will make you, especially if you were about, you were on the brink of war already. Like seeing this film, you would be like, yeah. "What am I about to do? Like, what am I about to waste my time?" Yeah, and on? that's, yeah, that's definitely something. Um, I think there's, it's real. Uh, I get this idea. Period pieces a lot say more about when they're made than right. when they're set. I think that's that's pretty. It's, I'm not saying anything right. new in saying that. Well, it's but, new to uh, me, yeah. but this is definitely this is it's definitely this is cautionary against oh, World War II yeah. on the brink of World War II. Co- and like as we look back, and honestly, as somebody who's you know we're so far from World War II at this point if you don't know enough you could hardly tell that it was World War One or World War Two, because like 
without any battles yeah. going on, without any sight of any... Really, there's no technology that would give it away. Yeah. I mean, there's old rifles and bad uniforms, but, yeah. like, it's really... Like, Everybody had old rifles well, and I mean, bad like, uniforms. you know, well, I mean, you, you know, if you know what equipment they had in each war, it's... You can tell, but, like, yeah. it's not... There's yeah. no dead giveaways which war it is. It could be almost any war. This story could literally be taking yeah. place during any war of the last, you know... Well, probably forever, frankly. Yeah, and it, it's it's in, it's interesting um, that you say uh, say that about knowing knowing that World War Two is coming. If you yeah. see this film, it'll it'll give you second thoughts. Uh, the French actually banned really? this movie. Yeah, the French banned it just provincially until the end of the war because they were afraid it would negatively affect soldiers' I can morale. See that. Like, but I kind of I tend yeah. to lean towards if. But at the same time, like, both, if you're, again, we they don't know that World War II is necessarily happening tomorrow. Yeah. Kind of I, I think by 1937, you're pretty yeah, sure something's, something's happen, on the, but you don't something's know. on the horizon. Like, but... like, I'm just thinking, like, I would tend to lean more towards the FDR kind of side of things, because war is portrayed as pointless in here, but for instance, the those guys, the, the main characters, lust for freedom, and the idea that, well, they must escape. They don't they're not attached to the idea of the war. They don't want to go back to the war. They're resigned that they're going to go back to the war when they escape. But their lust for their freedom and their belief that that's something they deserve and that they've earned yeah. and that they are going to earn back is a pretty powerful message for, for example, a republic or a democracy, though. So. <laughs> oh, certainly, certainly. And yeah, it's a little surprising that France went and banned it, but at the same time, it's... Uh... It's understandable, yeah, it is. I it's, guess. I mean, I don't. Obviously, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a fan of banning any media like that. Um, but, well, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I can. I, I can understand the French government. Well, and I think it's, I it's a really a thing that's like. Well, it just depends on what each person takes away from the film, because you can definitely walk away thinking like, "Oh, war's pointless," which because that's a major message. But then you also yeah. get a very strong message that freedom is something you have to work for. And so you yeah. get you. you and at the same time, you can just walk away thinking, oh, this right. was a boring and what, movie. And what you get, like, kind of is, you, it's really easy to see both perspectives. The Gerbil, like the Goebbels thing and the uh, FDR perspective are both there. And just depends oh, yeah. on how you walk away from the film. Or, yeah, if you just fall asleep. Exactly. Because it's pretty long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, what, it's like two hours, but, right? uh, I'll, I'll be honest, um... And and I'm sure we'll get to uh, we'll get to Citizen oh, Kane at some point. Yeah. But given that those two are both really high up on on greatest yeah. movies ever's list, um, uh, Citizen Kane has a lot more going on with it with cinematography because there's a lot of really innovative yeah. shots in Citizen Kane. But the pacing of that movie is I so much. I really worse feel like it's also Citizen Kane's one of those things where it depends on the person. Because I when I watched it, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It wasn't even like a this is the greatest movie oh. ever made. You got to watch it thing like. I knew of its status, but not thoroughly. Yeah. It was more just like, somebody's it's, like, you should watch this movie because it's a good movie. And I watched it, and I really enjoyed it. It's weird. I don't know. It depends on the person, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, we'll, we'll get I mean, much more deeply came when it's time to watch this. <laughs> I mean, when the pacing on this wasn't too... I didn't think uh, like, the pacing was too bad on this film. Like, there were a few times where I was like, oh, goodness, what happened? Why, why, why did we slow down? Because there's a yeah, I, su I suppose this. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I I was just going to say. I suppose well, I mean, there true, were just a few but... moments where, like, all of a sudden, the pace slowed down. It felt like, and then I was like, yeah, you get to these points where you're like, does this part need to be in the film? I don't know. But I'm not, and I'm not talking about the last twenty minutes. That's another a conversation for a few minutes from now. But like, <laughs> there were just a few moments where like the, the pace slowed down, and I was like, wow, we just entered like the twilight zone or something where like this movie gets really boring for 10 minutes and then it picks back up like in <laughs> the, you know i understand that like things are different when this film was made but just you know where there's to me it felt like a sudden shift in pacing and i i can't even think of yeah. the exact yeah. an exact de uh example just there were a couple of scenes where like they it felt like he was going too far out of his way to show their daily life in the the camp that like just yeah. didn't feel necessary to me. It's like you could have had like one establishing shot, like one establishing scene where you like, okay, yeah. they're all really cordial with the guards, 
But then we have like six of them. <coughs> it's like, look at these fun things they do with the guards. And then, as you pointed out before, the Hogan's Heroes element of it. Every so often, it's like, oh, <laughs> Bound Hofstein, you silly boy. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, sort yeah. of laughing at them. Um, yeah, so, no, on on that point, though, it's, it's interesting. Because Hogan's Heroes, obviously, clearly yeah. World War Two, And World War Two has, you know, we... I think we think in America, kind of what we're taught is that is that the Germans are the bad guys in World War yeah. One, but that's not necessarily true because World War One was an argument between a bunch of aristocrats, well, right? And basically. basically just evolved into a war. And yeah, nobody yeah. in World War One legitimately, there's not really any bad guy. There's just a bunch of people yeah, who don't yeah. know what's World going on. World War Two, right. obviously, we 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 have a right, bad guy right. in World War Two, but but one theme, one theme. In this movie, and there's certainly some some class issues with the aristocracy, von Raffenstein and de Boulier, um, but at the same time, everybody, everybody, Germans, French, British, Russians, everybody is cordial. Everybody's equals. Yeah. Well, there's still guards, and there's still within prisoners. their sort of class position. There's a little bit of class differentiation. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, as a modern American, yeah. feels a bit That's, weird, but. Yeah, obviously, obviously, von Raffenstein takes takes very kindly to de Boulier just because they're both um, you know, members of the aristocracy, um, old families. Uh, but at the same time, he's just as kind to yes, say Marichal at they the do beginning. They treat each other that yeah. that yeah that very first scene with Raffenstein after because he's the pilot who shot down right. the other two um, and. And we're introduced with him walking into a room with the rest of his crew and saying, I've just shot these two guys down. Go find them at the sugar factory. Invite them in for yeah, lunch. Yeah. Well, and like, just the fact that <laughs> and like, brings them in. von Raufenstein offers um, Marshall lunch like at all, being not an yeah. aristocrat, just another yeah. pilot. Yeah. And and also the way that scene ends, I think, is really poignant for for this whole "oh, we're all humans" idea. Very early on, um, everybody, Marshall, Marshall, and De Boulier get really uncomfortable uh, because von Raffenstein, uh, his men arrive with a wreath, wreath they brought in that's uh, a condolence that they're going to send to the regiment that of someone they shot and yeah, killed. Yeah. Prior, prior to the action of the of the movie, um, and it's just it's this really humanizing moment for them, and that's really really yeah, weird. especially the speech, the the, the yeah, I, I forget what he says in the speech, but yeah, it had a very like odd feel to it, yeah, where he's like yeah talking yeah. about these brave men and and he yeah yeah, and he he apologizes to to Marshall and. De Boulier for uh, for having yeah, that for awkward this, moment. This unfortunate yeah. coincidence, I think he calls it. Yes, yes, he does. Um, and and which is another thing, you know, you could you could read a lot of what he says as sort of like veiled sarcasm. Yeah, I, uh, especially <laughs> but, if you didn't have the con- like, but you know, the acting kind of plays it off. Yeah. The, the the actor does a oh, very yeah. good job oh, of the like, acting in this movie. Is the just, actor does it a very good job, despite being Doctor so Doom of. Letting you know that he's <laughs> yes. sincere about what he's saying, if a little yeah, bit yeah. hoity-toity. And he's, he's very, <laughs> he is but a little sincere. hoity-toity, and uh, one, yeah, and one one thing we get into that with De Bourdieu is uh, that he's he's afraid that his hoity-toitiness is going to go away. Yeah, when is because um, because he sees um, he sees Marichal and he sees. Uh, Rosenthal as sort of threats at some points later in the movie. He ta- he doesn't, I mean, he's not antagonistic to them, but he's still considering them below yeah. himself in conversations between the two aristocrats um, because they're old money. Marischal is just, you know, middle just class a guy, yeah. repairman. He's a, a mechanic, I think. Um, and then Rosenthal, he's new money. His parents are Jewish yeah. bankers who, they're immigrants even. Um, yeah, they're not even. He's a naturalized citizen in France. It's really... Yeah, yeah. And there's there's a great there's a great humanizing moment for Rosenthal um, 
which I think is definitely looking forward to World War II because he's he's the Jew and we're not he's a he's the son of bankers, but at the same time he's not uh he's not a stereotypical no, yeah, Jew. Like, That's the most stereotypical. It, the, the amazing thing about it is, is how like I don't know much about the sort of climate of attitudes at the time, but like he is played off as one of the nicest guys in the film. Like he even plays oh, yeah. off of yeah. himself. I mean, as he's far, rich, yeah, he's but like, he's not greedy. greedy. He's and he makes jokes about why he shares, but you can tell that he just shares because he shares. Yeah. He he makes jokes about like being like yeah. prideful and stuff, but in the end, he just shares. Yeah. And when when they call him, when they call him on being nouveau leash, uh, he he goes into you know I I liked France enough to come and buy land. You guys don't own land in yeah. your country. But I liked it enough to buy this land to choose yeah. to live here. I have chosen right, to become right. French. And and De Boulier says something, oh, I never thought about patriotism. Well, and you get way. into, which actually, which you know, if, good and sake, we don't want to get into a conversation about patriotism and immigration. But yeah, you get into the, like, <laughs> somebody who chooses to be in your country and become one of your citizens is probably your greatest patriot, relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's certainly, it's more... More patriotic than someone who's just you know, well, yeah, born like, there and, and I guess going yeah, exactly. through emotions. I guess so. That, to yeah, me. but uh, but but one thing I was really surprised with Rosenthal was we. I mean, we still get. I mean, obviously, he doesn't do anything overtly sort of Jewish right. custom wise. I mean, he's not. He's not. <laughs> yeah, like right, right, right. Or anything. Yeah, yeah, for us, just take a vote for but, us uh, to get really serious. The, thing, the only thing I know about Jewish yeah. Judaism, he does menorahs. <laughs> or legitimately, that's the only yeah, thing I know. That's terrible for us. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, but but at the same time, he does he does talk about his mm. religion um, a yeah. little a little bit. Uh, they but but I think one thing that that this movie really gets into is sort of the arbitrariness of division. Um, and Rosenthal says at one point when they when they're looking at. Switzerland, Marshall says, "Oh, I can't see the border," and and Rosenthal says, "Well, of course you can't. Borders are unnatural. Na- borders are man-made. Nature yeah. doesn't care." Um, uh, and I think, I think, in s- really subtle ways, uh, they establish that sort of religion. In the same way is, yeah. is just as arbitrary a, a division. Um, you know, Marshall at one point, when when things are really bad toward the end, he says that. Jehovah can go to hell. Well, right, but, um, and, but you and, kind of get you get and Rosenthal kind well, of well. You also, but you off. get an impression from out throughout the film that Marischal is completely ambivalent towards religion in general. He has no yeah, functional yeah, religion, as far as you can tell, throughout the film. Other characters you kind of pick up on some yeah. sort of element. But, yeah, yeah, no, certainly true, certainly true. Um, <laughs> but uh, what was I going to say? Oh, um. <laughs> Back to Rothenstein, um, and his sort of re- relationship with De Bourdieu because of their aristocracy. De Bourdieu, by that point in the movie, when they're having these conversations, and even in part because of these conversations, uh, has really made his decision that uh, the new way is the right. right way, and he can let go of his aristocracy. Um, Rothenstein doesn't. Rothenstein has sort of a, a Lieutenant Dan yeah. moment. Um, he he regrets not dying yeah. in war because now he's living as an invalid. Um, and there's really I read just yesterday um, that something like 31 percent of the graduating class of Oxford died in World really? War One. I. I was out of it. Um, because because aristocracy, there is this sort of we go to war because right right we're nobles. <laughs> We don't um, get drafted. This the yeah. sense of duty at it. The sense of the sense of you know it, it'll be it'll be a good time. Yeah, yeah, it'll be a grand old time. <laughs> we'll go. Yeah. we'll fight the fight. The grand old time. Um, <laughs> and von Rothenstein gets into that a little bit because he he regrets not being able to fight anymore, and he's only acting as the commandant of of the prison because it's all he has left right. that he can do. Um, and he, he refers to it as a feudal existence, I believe. Um, but de Boudier takes that and he doesn't think his existence is feudal anymore, uh, because he can, 
he can still make a heroic yeah, sacrifice. Yeah, well, and there's a he, certain he, he weirdly does. aristocratic uh, element to what he does, though, with his sacrifice. I mean, he doesn't give up on that idea yeah. anyway. He talks no, about that's... duty the whole time. And it's the idea that, like, he does, because he, does. he is an aristocrat, it's his job to die so that these guys, the non-aristocrats, can live. Which is a really weird idea there, to there deal is... with. There is certainly an element to that, but at the same time, he's not sending his underlings to their right. death. So it's it's like it's the right, flip it's exactly side of the like, coin. It's like it's on really that. in a weird sort of way a more sort of basic aristocratic idea than than the other way around, right? Yeah, because yeah. like the whole war at the time, and you know, mind you, they're making this film a fair amount of time after the war. But yeah, twenty years. The later. whole war is a is nothing but a series of aristocrats sending their uh, you know, various well, countrymen who are not aristocrats to their death, right? And feudal charges across yeah, no yeah. man's land and things like that. And then you have this sort of like Renoir taking the, you know, you guys did this, but look at what you should have been doing, kind of thing. Like a, you should yeah, have been yeah. laying yourselves down to make sure that didn't happen. So I don't know if that was his main yeah. message, but that's yeah, one of the yeah, things I, I got out of it for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot yeah. of subtle themes in this. Which is movie. why this will there's not a, be a half an hour. Pa- it's podcast. almost literary in that. Not today. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but one thing. Uh, what was I going to say? Rothenstein, uh He not only looks and looks down on them. He calls. Uh, he calls it their their whole the whole idea that these people can be worthwhile. The uh, charming legacy of the French yeah, Revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there really? Um, it's it's really it's it's the one point where I mean at least as a modern American watching it I I start to right and hate the, him. the thing is, is that it's weird because I felt the same way but at the same time that was totally not the point you know what I mean it, you he's not supposed yeah. to be a bad guy yeah and no point is it but he no, feels like a bad not. guy too in America but if you look at it but but at the same time. We right, want there to be a bad, bad guy. guy because it's right, an, it's like, a war he's movie. Not the so. bad guy. Like, and the thing is, is that like at the time <laughs> the film was made, he wasn't the bad guy. I don't think. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. because you had had the French Revolution, exactly. you had had World War One, but you hadn't had World War Two, which was a major equalizer. There was still aristocrat uh, aristocracy uh, uh, present, and certainly you, without that element. There was even aristocracy in the United States. They weren't aristocracy, but they were the old money, and and they had a different yeah. life. They had a yeah. different world than, and those people would have watched in 1937 and said, "This is a good man," at least, or had thought he's a tragically behind figure, but not a bad guy. But now we're like, yeah. oh gosh, that, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> But but at the same time we see him as a bad guy. Right, right, right. Yeah, they throw that in so, there. Yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Which which is which is something that Renoir definitely tries to hammer home that they're not right. bad. They, just they, they're in fact, they're pre, they're, um, the way the Germans are portrayed in the film is just so. In fact, they come out almost being better than the, uh, the French the, and the other, in prison. Yeah, yeah they treat like, everybody it doesn't so matter well. Who you are. The only time they kill anybody is when somebody actually manages to get outside the walls. Like, and they go to yeah. great lengths at times, it seems like, to not inflict harm. And, and on that point, when they get to the second camp, we're told that de Beaulieu and Rosenthal and everybody has like four to right. eight and, escape And they're all still alive and totally them. healthy. And they, they're still alive. Yeah. Exactly. Um... So it's just they they do we do have one person shot for trying to escape, but at the same time it seems like that's really something everybody's Yeah, like the to Germans avoid. are going out of their way not to shoot the escapees. Like they yeah. only do it if and they have uh, to. Yeah. And von Rothenstein even says, and I think it's 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 a subtle sort of jab that everybody's barbaric mm-hmm. too. But when they arrive at, at his camp, he says, oh, we're not running it. In order to avoid the appearance of German barbarism, we're running it on, running this camp right, on the French right, regulations. Are, and from everything you can tell in the whole thing, <coughs> it's identical in every way to everything else. Yeah. Like they haven't changed anything. <laughs> yes. 
if he's if he's serious when he says that, and he gives them the French regulations books, so it's suggesting yeah. that he is very serious when he says that. He says right. it makes good bedtime reading, and I think it's just this whole this whole joke about oh we're right. all the same, well, we're <laughs> we're supposed to be acting just as <laughs> you guys are supposed to be acting just as bad as right. we're supposed to be acting. Well, and considering that um, this whole shoot on site if they try to escape, yeah, and like considering that this is on the eve, not the eve, but getting close to the eve of World War Two, I think that was a, a major idea is that he's going to be like look, that. Renoir is going for is like yeah. look, these even if he uses the French regulations. He's still going to be just as bad of a guy. And he's not going to be basically yeah. any different yeah. than who he was before. So exactly, and I think that's 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 where he gets when Wong gets into his anti-warness. He's not out to show that war is hell. He's not out to show the trenches and right. to to make us sick of war by seeing war. He's out to point out that war is pointless because we all right, act exactly. the same. That we're all we're all similar people. Um, yeah, nobody's yeah. fighting the war because they're evil. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, at least yeah. in this one, World War Two, World War Two, well, we yeah. can get into arguments on on justness, but at the same well, time, we don't need to get into World War Two. At the same time, time yeah. World War Two. But no, kind we of, do, yeah, yeah, there's that. There's an element the, you can make the You're same right. move. Let's yeah. let's step away from that. We could we could go well, down yeah, that road. Yeah, we could, we could have for, a very long hours, pocket. So. But I mean, like that goes back to the point that I said at the yeah. beginning that this movie could take place if you take out and replace whatever armor or you know weapons they have could yeah, it could be yeah. any could any, war, any war where any they time. take war prisoners of war basically and you could have the same story you could have the same yeah. exact story take place in World War 2 and it would be functionally identical because the, that like Joe yeah. Schmo and, in, and Joe Schmo the German soldier in the POW camp is not an evil guy and he wouldn't be an evil guy in this movie either yeah. either were and and things like Hogan's Heroes kind of yeah, make that, yeah. <laughs> in a make that way, point yeah. in a way, but in the still Hogan's Heroes right, does yeah. it for a completely different reason. They do it because they don't want they want to show the the Nazis right, are right. competent. Yeah. They're not they're not trying to they're humanize them. They're trying hearts. to yeah. uh, they're trying to make them look dumb. Yeah, but I mean <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Is you could uh, again, yeah, you could have had this movie in any time period, and it would and replace those soldiers with Nazi soldiers or North Vietnamese or. North Koreans, and it would yeah. be the same story. So, yeah. Yeah. you you've you've said you didn't like not, the last well, twenty okay. minutes of the movie because you feel Actually, like it's my, just tacked well, on. I did say that that way, and I didn't mean to imply that. What happened to me was when we started the second, the last twenty minutes after it had felt like the movie had ended. Then they, st- it felt like he yeah. started a new movie that is twenty minutes long. That I also. And then after about, about five minutes or ten minutes into that new movie, I became engrossed in that new movie, that last 20-minute new movie, and then wanted to see that come to completion. Okay. Okay. But, like, it didn't feel like... Yeah. It wasn't necessary. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. The entire third act is very... The falling action is very much its own yeah, sort of it's, I mean, there's plot. a love story, and there was yeah. never any love elements in there. Yeah. And, like, then... And then... Yeah to cap it off the, the the film ends before you actually find out find out what happens with the love story which is just nasty yeah. because they started yeah. a 20 minute long love story and then didn't end it <laughs> it's like oh he has to leave to go back to war it's true. does he it's die true. does he it's come true. back we don't know right. so a little a little establishment here uh, if you haven't but you should seen the film you or the you're podcast. Trying, to, uh, trying to follow along yeah um so, uh, spoiler <laughs> warning. Uh, as if the rest as if, of the... As if that isn't clear that yeah, we need one so far. As if so the far. rest of the podcast is um, one big spoiler. Yes. Rosenthal, yeah, Rosenthal and Marischal have escaped the Imprenal prison in part because uh, de Boulier, in a sort of Pied Piper thing, has led all of the guards in the entire camp around playing his flute. <laughs> yeah, in a merry and, chase. And lured them yeah. to distract them. Yes, in a merry chase. Um... And finally, uh, von Raffenstein, in order to stop him, uh, shoots him. And he says specifically, and I believe him, that he meant to shoot him in the leg, but he actually he yeah. gut shot him. And and de Boulier is even forgiving of that. He says, "Oh, there was distance. Yeah. It was night. It was you, you couldn't see. That's fine. You're made of um, metal." And and de Boulier, he dies in that sequence. And 
there's a really great moment because because De Boulier obviously is is sort of uh, sort of von Raffenstein's last semblance mm. of the old world. Um, the last the last bit of the aristocracy for him, um, and his life is completely right. futile. After 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 De Boulier's dead, and and the fact that he's killed him is even worse. So there's this moment he goes back to his room, and there's I think you mean a geranium, geranium in the room. Geranium, geranium. I know. <laughs> I can't talk. It's early. Uh, geranium in the room that uh, we've we've said is the it only grow thing here, of beauty yeah. that grows in the whole castle. It's all ivy. Yeah. Um, and he goes back, and he's he's so mad at himself. I think. But at the same time, disappointed in himself, I guess, that he cuts off, he cuts off the bud of the geranium, and, uh, yeah. and kills the flower after he's killed De Boulier. Um which which in a weird way is a love story element yes. in the early part they, of the they film. Are, um, <laughs> yeah, there's a certain love element between but, them. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to, no, I don't no, want to try like and suggest that they were doing anything on as the, the side, only two but, aristocrats but it's very, around. It's, it's platonic, yeah, but it's they a have very a certain, deep. Yeah, yeah. It's a very intimate you relationship. You see them throughout the film. You actually see them um, talking in a way that suggests no prisoner relationship at all. Like they have conversations with each other yeah. as though they're just yeah. two, yeah, friends. They're just friends, yeah. and they really are. I mean, they talk about how they went to the same places yeah. in Paris before the war. They they both met this waitress yeah. Fifi at Maxime's, and. <laughs> And and suggested that they both kind of had a relationship with her. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is, so, mm-hmm. so there's this. Well, there's and Ro- a lot and of background. It, uh, Ro- um, von Raufenstein uh, knows De Boulier's cousin or something, as like a who was an adjutant yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the word. Yeah, yeah. It's, they talk about that too. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's really good because obviously they're very close. And and then his his yeah. only friend dies, and he's well, killed. You him, can really so, get the element so he, that when Ro- Ro- Ralphenstein kills that flower in a certain way, that is not a symbol of the Boulier, but a symbol of himself. He's done. There's nothing left. Yeah. In his life, yeah. he has killed his Absolutely. only friend, the only person he could relate to in his whole world. Everybody else is a subordinate or just a prisoner. And now, basically, von Ralphenstein is yeah. dead. When he shot De Boulier, he shot yeah. himself. And 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 even if he weren't at the camp, he can't really relate to his fellow aristocrats anymore because he's so broken. Right. And he didn't die in the war. He's coming. It's a. It, there's a so certain Spartan it's just, with your shield or on it motif that yeah. he didn't succeed yeah. in either. You know, he is a half yeah. metal Doctor yeah. Doom character who yes. killed his only friend. He's, he's more yeah. mechanical than No, anymore. they they got it for bringing it back there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh we were getting getting into the last twenty minutes. After the escape, um there is that that, that love story element. Uh and it's the one time when we meet uh I don't, I can't remember the German her woman. Elsa, I think. Elsa Elsa is her name. Um <clears throat> they end up at her farmhouse, and she comes out, and they they think they're going to have to kill her. So Marichal is ready with this big club, but it's just a woman, so they don't. They give her a chance, and she takes them inside. And she, obviously, she's not so sure they can trust. <laughs> she can trust them. They're not so sure <clears throat> she can trust her. Some German soldiers arrive, and she just sends them on their way. But at the same time, these German soldiers—they're not looking for no. They're for looking our to find out like how they're, far they are to the next they're, town. Yeah, they're looking for a town. Yeah, and they're so they're so like well, jovial yeah, in it. It's just it's real. Even these guys who, if they found them, would probably have to shoot our heroes. Yeah, they're just bad guys. Guys who are a little bit lost. <laughs> and just, even the just the, guy, the visit the soldier yeah. we see makes a joke about how I'd much rather stay here than march for another. What yeah, twelve it's, miles it's, or something exactly. like that, seven kilometers yeah. or something. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's yeah, um, but but there is the one moment I think where we get the hint of this war is hell element is with her, when she, we kind of pan across the pictures of her brothers and her husband, who have been killed in the war and killed killed in battles that were generally regarded as well, yeah, and German like, successes and, and great battles supposedly, yeah. Great battles, at least, um, and and they're all dead. And it really reminds me of 
Another anti-war film that's not nearly as subtle, but, but just as entertaining, Patty Chayefsky's uh, The Americanization of Emily. Uh, James Garner stars, uh, and he's, he's a devout coward, he says. Uh, he's trying to avoid going into World War II, and, and The Americanization of Emily, in the same way that this is mo a movie on the brink of World War II, looking back at World War I, it takes place during World War II, but it was made okay. in 64. So kind of right in the middle of, of a lot of a lot of things going on, um, a lot of anti-war elements, uh, and and in that in that regard, it can be it can afford to be yeah. less subtle too, I think. Um, but at the same time, Chayefsky is kind of uh, his days Aaron <laughs> Sorkin. Uh, he likes he likes his characters to have very big, long uh, political uh, yeah. sort of diatribes, well, monologues. Oh, go ahead. I suppose. Um, well, I, I, I'd like to read a quote that uh, something James Garner's character says to uh, a war widow uh, on on the subject of war, um, and like I said, it's a lot less it's a lot less uh, subtle yeah. than anything anything in 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 the other movie in the Grand Illusion. But at the same time, it hints at hints at the illusions we have at war of war. Um, so here's here's what he says. Um, and it's pretty long, and I apologize, but it's, it's great context for everything. Um, war isn't hell at all. It's man at his best, the highest morality he's capable of. It's not war that's insane, you see. It's the morality of it. It's not greed and ambition that makes war. It's goodness. Wars are always fought for the best reasons, for liberation or manifest destiny. Always against tyranny and always in the interest of humanity. <clears throat> so far, this war we've managed to butcher some 10 million humans in the interest of humanity. Next war, it seems, we'll have to destroy all of man in order to preserve his damn dignity. It's not war that's unnatural to us. It's virtue. As long as valor, valor remains a virtue, we shall have soldiers. So I preach cowardice. Through cowardice, we shall be saved. I don't trust people who make bitter reflections about war. It's always the generals with the bloodiest records who are the first to shout that, oh, what a hell it is. And it's always the widows who leave the Memorial Day parades. We shall never end wars by blaming it on ministers and generals or warmongering imperialists or all the other banal bogies. It's the rest of us who build statues to those generals and name boulevards after those ministers. The rest of us who make heroes of our dead and shrines of our battlefields. We wear our widow's weeds like nuns and perpetuate war by exalting its sacrifices. My brother died at Anzio, an everyday soldier's death, no special heroism involved. They buried what pieces of them he found, what pieces they found of him, but my mother insists that he died a brave death and pretends to be very proud. And now my other brother can't wait to reach enlistment age. That'll be in September. Maybe ministers and generals who blunder us into war, but the least the rest of us can do is resist honoring the institution. What has my mother got for pretending bravery was admirable? She's under constant sedative and terrified. She may wake up one morning and find her last son has run off to be brave. Yeah, I mean that's a, and it's it's a it's slightly different point to what than Mars. than yeah yeah it, but it's, it's very, very similar. similar and yeah well uh, yeah as you said not a lot less subtle but yeah you do get that element but at the same time that's yeah the, you know not to get off of that quote so quickly but like um the widow that we meet uh, whatever her name is I already forgot Elsa. And I don't know. She was just a widow to me when I was watching. Uh, she, she. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's understood. I felt that that part of that scene was completely unnecessary. We didn't need to do that because it, in a lot of ways, destroyed the subtlety that was the rest of the film. It's like, and now I'm going to hit you in the face with I this can rubber see ticket. That now, you know what I mean? It's like we, I've, because he spent the entire film building up. This is all very pointless by making you think about the characters and their motivations, right? Yeah. The whole film is building subtle, yeah. deep motivations for the main characters, why they do what they do, like why they are here, why they fought in the war, but without ever showing you anymore. And then just saying like, look at these empty chairs and look at these paintings or these pictures on the wall of all these dead men. It, it's, it's like it's just a total derailment from that subtlety yeah. it's like just in case you, it kind of in a certain way feels very modern in that like you find that in a lot of modern filmmaking they'll do a really subtle job and at the end it's like just in case you didn't get it here's the entire <laughs> yeah like let's, let's beat here's you on the head with a hammer thing. Thing <laughs> laid out by some character who's just going to say it because we think yeah. you might be dumb 
we may think you we think you may yes. be incompetent and <laughs> incapable of determining the reasonings for this <laughs> and like it's just the only way he could have made it less settled that one moment is if like it hadn't been uh if it had been another aristocrat uh, another aristocrat who escaped and then there was a little bit of a class war element there too in there like they didn't he didn't put that in I thank goodness but just that 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 pan <laughs> across the pictures yeah. and the and the empty seats with his daughter with her daughter would be very moving in another film that wasn't as subtle as this one but in a subtle movie like this it okay. came okay. off no, more I, I... just kind of silly it's it's very much yeah it's it's a slap it's a it's a it's a get your attention and you know i i agree with you that that it's very different but i think it's still it's a little necessary i think just because it just to make sure that Goebbels well, knew that he should ban okay. the film uh yeah <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> that, that, that Goebbels <laughs> needs to remember to ban it uh Actually, one thing, Renoir took a lot of flack for not showing the horrors of war. A lot of early reviews um, didn't didn't like that yeah. he was so subtle, I guess. Um, which which kind of kind of says, well, there's a reason then that we need to be less subtle at some point in it. And obviously the ruse didn't come in until after the movie was released, so he, he yeah, was anyway. looking ahead maybe. But But at the same time, I think you make a solid argument too. That, that it is... I hadn't thought about it that way. I just find that behavior... That like, is. I understand why he did it. I don't have a problem with it. It's just, in a certain way, it feels a little insulting. It's not really bad, because it's yeah. not as, no, as I... over-the-top as it could be. Like I said, in a lot of modern movie-making, you'll have a you'll have a character just basically, like, do exposition on yeah. the themes. Like... Just... Yeah, like the the end of the second act or the beginning of the third, somebody yeah, would just show yeah. up and give you know three pages worth of yeah. Hey, and, here's what and the movie's so it, it wasn't that bad, and so <laughs> like it's not as bad as it could have been, and yeah, and in general it wasn't too bad because he only spends like maybe what like a minute less than a minute on that, and then it moves on and it yeah. replaces it with yeah. a love story, um, but <laughs> it yeah. just does to me felt a little bit like really. Like I m- remember when I yeah. watched it, thinking, "Yeah, really? Did we need to do that?" So yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I uh, yeah. I respectfully well, yeah, disagree fine. there. I think, but that's the point. No, of I definitely this podcast. understand. Um, we should na- rename it. Did we respectfully yes, dis- <laughs> disagree? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Um, but yeah, uh, that that segues us. You you mentioned there's no resolution to the love story. I think that's kind of. I think there's a point to that in that he's told her she's he's coming back as if after there the is war. an end, yeah. But I think, yeah. I think at the same time, she knows that's not true, given the look he's in. She she kind of gives, and this whole resolution to loneliness after after they left, we get another pan across all the empty chairs and tables as the daughter yeah. sits and eats breakfast. Um. So I think. I think that you know there was a point in not showing us him coming back because he's the war. If the war ends, when the war ends, he's just going to go back to his life and the things, the things we do during war. Have yeah, no and I can effect. see that that, that that love story does um, play into the overall theme of of the pointlessness of this entire yeah. engagement. Is that like you know you met this woman, but does she actually mean anything in the long run? But. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I well, I know, but it's does, just I I find unresolved. Or I find that kind of love story depressing. Yeah. So yeah, no, no, I I, I certainly understand. Well, it, it's depressing. weird for me it that that depressing. love story has but, is more impactful, yeah. depressing wise than the the entire hour and a half of war is pointless slaughter. Yeah, yeah. well, it's more yeah. it's more uh, no. You've never been in a war, so it's more, yeah, yeah, uh, and it, it's I mean, something it's just you can relate to. Yeah. Better, I think I don't know. It's just because, like, when yeah. he, you can get also like because of the acting, it's really good. The way Marin Shaw says that he'll be back, you totally believe that he wants to come back, but at the same time, you know he will never be back. Yeah, either the war will kill him or he just won't come yeah. back. Yeah, no. 
Absolutely true. And and he leaves, uh, obviously, with the intent of going back to the war. And and he says that they need to get back to the front lines, he and, he and Rosenthal, uh, as they leave the house. They need to get back to the fight front lines so that they can end this war in the hopes that yeah, right. there will be no more wars. Because this is, I mean, there's a reason World War One was called the Great War. Because it was supposed to be yeah. the war that ended all wars, and twenty years later, and we did it again. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. And Rosenthal calls him on that. He he says he says you're delusional. In my translation, I think I think it says I think he might say that's an illusion. Yeah. Uh, in the actual yeah, French, like well, but, I mean, uh, yeah, he brings up he's, he's, he, he really it's weird. Rosenthal is also just totally take a step back, like way back to like earlier in the podcast, but is the only, in my mind, rational person in the story. He's the only one who has he not really deluded is. himself in he some really way is. or another. Like, de Boulier dies for yeah. his duty. Raffenstein kills for his duty, and then you get the impression that he dies because he did yeah. his duty. Inside. At least on a on an yeah. emotional level. And then, you know, yeah. Yeah, Marin Shaw is, personal on emotional first level. of all, like, is kind of a joker at the beginning and then falls in love with this woman and exists in this world where the war is going to end, everything's going to be good. And he does this at the beginning, too. He talks about, oh, it'll be over in a week or something like that, you know? And I think it read the very first scene he, that, that he's in. He talks about how it's going to end soon. It'll be over soon. And and then he talks mm-hmm. about how it's the last war that we'll ever fight. And, like, Rosenthal and the other characters who come in are a little bit delusional. And then there's... Rosenthal, who is totally rational about the fact that this is not the last war. This is not even the yeah. end of this war. Yeah. It's, 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 yeah, he keeps... He, he does... He calls yeah. them on it multiple times throughout the movie. He, he says that you're... Thinking that this war is going to be over soon is an illusion. Thinking that it's going to be the last yeah. war is an illusion. Um, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, he's agreed with Marischal that they need to go back right. to the front lines and try to end this war. Um, so they're both they're both on their way back, um, and I guess that that kind of brings yeah. us to the end of things. Uh, but so he thinks he thinks they're all, you know, that they're they're delusional for trying, but they're still going to try because what else are well, you going to do? You have to try. I guess. character in general is that like he sees this as pointless, he sees he's totally rational, and then he also knows that, well, what else are we gonna do? We gotta do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Gotta, yeah. Gotta do something, Just because I you guess. know it's yeah. pointless doesn't mean you don't do um, it. So. Yeah. <laughs> because, well, it's 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 impossible to right. uh, yeah, get right. everyone so else to, to change, give in. I guess. So, you've gotta, yeah, you've gotta give in, or, uh, you know, get killed in the process, I guess. Um, but I think there's there's a really great moment at the very end, yes, the which very is both last of our favorite lines, lines of the movie. Of the movie. I think both um, of us that agree. are just yeah one one great great moment. Um, the German border patrol are shooting at the men as they've made it across the border, um, and uh, and obviously the border can't be seen, which Rosenthal has pointed out to us. Borders are man-made; nature doesn't care. Uh, so they're still being shot at, and one of the uh, Border Patrol interrupts the guy actually shooting and says, don't shoot, they're in Switzerland. And the other guy's got this really longing look in his face. As he as he looks at them, he puts his gun down, and he says, yeah. I'm good for them. As yeah, they've, and they've what, made it, it out. It's is really um, interesting because both of them are planning to go back to the war. It's really like, there's this German soldier yes, longing true, to escape true. from the situation, and... The two people he, they've escaped and they're just going and right back escaped. in. And they've escaped, yeah, yeah, and they plan to go right back in. But at the same time, uh, in the same way that that Marischal's so intently saying, "Oh, I'm coming back for you, Elsa," you know, we don't necessarily right, know that true. they're really they are in Switzerland. Back war. Which maybe uh, is the intentions towards? of the emotional moment. Well, and also Rosenthal's oh, yeah, a I'm pretty Swiss sure it was by birth, to. right? So I think it's possible that. Yeah, yeah, we I don't know so. what's going to happen. Uh, I think it was from immigrant. Switzerland. I can't remember from where. I'm pretty um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty they sure They say it, but I can't remember. So. But. Yeah, so. So, um. 
Well, I think that that well, covers yeah, pretty much I everything I want to talk about. So you know, it's a it's it's a really interesting interesting way of making an anti-war film. It's a great movie, great cinematography, great great sound yeah, work, yeah. Um, great writing. I think only uh, you have some problems with only pacing, but uh, I'm not. And then the last only, twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think. Uh, yeah, and then the last twenty minutes. That seems like a separate a nice movie, separate but as a separate movie, movie even yeah. it's still a good movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, thanks for listening. Yeah. This was a little longer than I expected it to be, but uh, but we'll, yeah, we'll uh, see if maybe we can we'll make see the how that works out in the a little bit shorter. Um, Who knows? Maybe they'll all be an hour long. Yes, <laughs> but as an introductory episode, oh, yeah. I think we're stellar. Oh wait, thanks don't, for listening. Yeah, tell we'll see you next, next time. Is. Oh. Okay, you want to do it or should I do it? Yeah, yeah. Next spine number seven two, samurai. seven samurai. Well, Akira Kurosawa, seven, seven, samurai. seven samurai. Spine number two. Uh, please enjoy it with us, and we'll get we'll get into that. But I feel a deep shame that well, I've never Adam, watched Akira Kurosawa. Well, Adam, this is your chance. Yeah, it's my chance. Yes. It's my chance. There's a lot on our list. Yep. See you next time. Thanks for Bye. listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>